Well, we've come to the end of uh, a full and fruitful and uh, fulfilling uh, two days. Um, I've asked my colleagues, uh, Elizabeth and Cole, to each just reflect for a few minutes and to give some uh, closing thoughts uh, of some of the lessons we may have learned or some of the uh, takeaways that we may uh, hope to leave with as we uh, return home. Elizabeth? First of all, my thought is one of gratitude. I'm grateful for all of you for sticking through it for two days and being part of this and giving us a reason to put this together. Um, I'm grateful for your interest and your commitment to these issues. Uh, I'm grateful to our presenters for their lifetimes of preparation that they've shared with us. Um, we're grateful to Zions Bank, to our International Advisory Council, those who made this financially possible that lets us bring in such wonderful guests. Is, this more? is that working better? Oh, that is working better. All right. Well, I won't repeat the thanks to those who've been expressed, but please consider yourself thanked. Um, but I just wanted to thank the staff here at BYU Continuing Education Conferences and Workshops, Andrea Ramsey, McKay Borman, Bran, and the people who struggled with the media and who made this possible here. Um, I also want to express thanks to our student fellows, the people you've seen running around with microphones the last two days. Those are students who have finished their first year of law school who are working with us, and we're grateful for them and their devotion. Um, and especially, I'm grateful for the team I work with at the International Center for Law and Religion Studies as we've been putting this together. Uh, Deborah Wright, Sandy Stevenson, uh, Blythe Shoup, who arranged all the media and the Facebook Live, the website, uh, and Sharman Blood, who um, made this happen. Um, but as I've been thinking over the last two days about my experience here and just sitting in the back when I could as a fly on the wall and watching all of you and our wonderful presenters, um, the word that keeps coming back to me is edification, being edified. I love that word because of this combination of education and learning and inspiration, uplifted, this, this combination of learning and learning from the spirit. Um, and I feel that way with the, the messages that I've heard and felt and the examples of the presenters who've come and the attendees that I've heard from. That word also resonates for me because of where it's found in Latter-day Saint scripture. Um, it often comes up in the context of gospel teaching, but I think it apply, applies here when we're learning truth through the spirit of God. Um, in Doctrine and Covenants 50, section 50, Latter-day Saint scripture, it says, wherefore he that preaches and he that receiveth understand one another and both are edified and rejoice together. I think this can be true when we learn together. And I've been struck by that phrase, rejoice together, um, because frankly, when we're out there being engaged on religious freedom issues, rejoice is not always the word that comes to mind. Um, we've heard a lot about some of the problems and challenges and the difficulties sharing messages in a world that's much more diverse and where there may be less common ground than we would like. Um, but the sense of rejoicing is one I felt here. And I, it reminds me of a woman I talked to who's come to several of these, and she talked about how the impact that it had on her and her community service, and how it's changed her in happy ways. And then ta started talking about her story, and I could see where the joy for her came from. She talked about the joy in working in these issues. And she said that the joy came when she was working on very difficult issues in a local elected office. Um, but she talked about learning and making friends and building bridges with people she didn't think she had anything in common with. And I can see where the joy came from. It came in inviting the spirit of the Lord to be part of the process as she loved and served his children. Um, this is one thing, I, one theme that's echoed to me as we've had these discussions over the last two days, whether the context is schools or workplace or working with LGBT individuals. I hear over and over again from numerous people, well, first you need to start by listening. You listen with love. You listen with concern for others. 
um, which I'm going to wrap up here, is it reminded me of another Latter-day Saint scripture about being at five. Right? In other place it says, let one speak at a time and all listen to his sayings, though in all who spoken, that all may be edified of all, and that every man may have an equal privilege. I'm grateful for that. I've seen that here where presenters may not have agreed, and I think that's been wonderful to see the way they can address their differences without, can disagree without being disagreeable. Um, who can, how can charity can infuse complex, difficult issues where we don't always see eye to eye, and religious freedom is often that. Um, I just want to close with my witness that God is involved in this work. And I have seen how his spirit can guide us in remarkable ways as we educate and prepare ourselves to be instruments in his hands. I know that you will feel the spirit working in you as you are humble, as you educate yourself, as you seek for opportunities, and that you will be led to opportunities to share your beliefs about religious freedom, about religion, in ways that truly edify, where we can understand one another and rejoice together. And that is my wish. So I think this has really been a remarkably rich conference. I, I've really been just struck by the fact in session after session uh, how things built on each other and how, uh, sig and how these things highlighted some of the things that we need to know and we need to know more about. I was struck from the beginning with the notion of uh, religious freedom being foundational. It's really the fountainhead of our other rights. It's, I often say it's the grandparent of other human rights, although often a neglected grandparent. Uh, I think we recognize that we need, that we live in a pluralistic world and that we need to be, become more sophisticated about how to deal with and respond to that pluralism. Uh, pluralism is not relativism. Pluralism recognizes that different individuals and groups have different, have deeply held visions and understanding of truth, including beliefs about proper social ordering. And peace is only possible if we find ways that will accommodate differences. Uh, peace can be stable only if people can be assured that life in their subcommunities is safe and does not face existential threats, as uh, Alexander Dushku talked about yesterday and if the overall structure of society reflects fairness for all. It's not just the freedom and equality for individuals that's crucial. At various points, we've had people stress that uh, that freedom, that individual freedom will be meaningless and not ultimately vindicated if autonomy of groups and institutions is not protected. Uh, we need to find ways to identify barriers that stand in the way of uh, finding solutions. Uh, uh, we need to recognize that as we work in this area, uh, there is a kind of striving. Sometimes people think that the answer will sort of terminate the need for striving. And I think that's a mistake. I, I remember I was at Harvard sort of in the early days of the critical legal studies movement, and, and one of the moves was always to say, well, there's this incoherence and tension, and, was, and the solution was going to be some release of this tension. My worry is that the, that the piece of tensionlessness is the piece of the graveyard, <laughs> uh, and that part of life is having striving. What we need to find are ways that our different kinds of strivings can fit together uh, in productive ways, in ways that will sort of limit uh, conflict, uh, but that will uh, make a difference. And, and that's, that's one of the fundamental things that we need to learn. And one of the fundamental realities about pluralism is that 
Pluralism may leave us with some unresolved tensions, but those tensions may themselves, uh, if limited in certain ways, uh, so that they're not existential threats to anyone, and they, uh, that, that that mutual striving and interaction can really lead to, uh, to deeper kinds of, of solutions. Uh, you know, if you think about it, the history of constitutionalism is not a history of finding some documents with a, a set of axioms that everyone has agreed to. What was remarkable about the American founders is realizing, sort of invoking ideas of a more ancient constitution, uh, invoking the ideas that government is limited and that you have to build into the dynamics of government ways of setting the limits. And that includes protecting things like religious institutions, other forms of institutions, the press, other kinds of structures that mediate between the individual and the state. And that that is really a critical part of what constitutionalism is about. Now let me just conclude by uh, sort of a comment about uh, despair. I remember one night, when this was when the 1997 Russian Constitution was being drafted. I've told some of you this story. And I was, this is the first year I was really working with the internet. Every morning I'd get up and would have the latest transmissions from Russia and, and there was this terrible law being drafted. And, and I went to a wedding one night and ran into Elder Dallin Oaks, who's uh, one of the 12. And he knew I was working on this. And he said, well, how are things going? And I'm saying, it's looking really bleak. And he said, be of good cheer. The Lord has overcome the world. Now, a few years later, I was in Russia, a meeting with the area presidency, and things were looking even worse. And having thought that was a really inspiring story, I told that story. And Elder Neuenschwander, who was doing his second stint as area president, said, yes, he's told me that story too. <laughs> it's just that I know how much he has to overcome. <laughs> but he has overcome the world. And one of the great things is that he does take <coughs> individual people who are willing to exercise faith and uh, and then there are tides of history that we can't begin to know how to move, but that move, and that, uh, I don't know if it'll be 20 years, but we will see things happening. One of the great things about working in this field for me is you get up in the morning and you know you're working on a true principle. And freedom of religion is a true principle. It goes to the core of what we are as human beings. It goes to the core of our existence, and it will prevail. As we, can as we conclude, I find myself thinking back to this morning's session, why religious freedom matters to me. And uh, Helen Williams' first line as she asked that rhetorical question, and she said, religious freedom provides me my right to be whole. And later in her address, she said, it allows me to be my authentic self, not the figment of someone else's imagination. And that left me believing, after hearing her powerful testimony, that my obligation is to strive to live my faith with as much vigor, energy, and commitment as she so self-evidently lives hers. And that's one uh, thing I think we can all do and go home and strive to love our families a little bit better and to hug our kids a little bit tighter and to live our own faiths uh, a little bit more authentically I think we've been reminded that from a variety of people, including Kent and Katrina. I also found myself reflecting on Bill Atkins' answer to that question. 
He said he cared about religious freedom because he cared about religion. Religious freedom doesn't save us. It doesn't uh, love us. It doesn't uh, provide us uh, aesthetic experience or bliss or nirvana or enlightenment. But it is one of the conditions that allows us as human beings to seek truth and to strive to live it. And so that is one of the ways that I think we can honor our commitment to religious freedom is to be people who seek after and try to live after truth as we understand it in our lives.